welcome to the Just and Center podcast. Once again, I am your host, Dr. Jordan Cooper. Thank you so much for joining me on the program today. And just a quick reminder that the Justin Center as an organization is supported by donors. So we would ask that you would consider contributing to us and the work that we do. You can go to justincenter.org, go to our donate page. You can sign up for a Patreon and get benefits there. Uh, and there are many ways that you can help. Uh, one of those things that you can do to help is to purchase our courses from the Widener Institute. And uh, we have our most recent course now available on the, the proper distinction between law and gospel. This is a course that was taught by Pastor Louis Polzin, who is our fellow of practical theology. He uh, taught this course on each of the 25 theses of, of Walther's popular book, his popular lectures on the proper distinction between law and gospel. So it's a really wonderful resource. You definitely want to check that out. Uh, you can go to justincenter.org and go to our Widener Institute page there. The Widener Institute offers theological courses as well as theological publications. We've got some really exciting uh, things coming up as well. And one of those things that we do have coming up soon is a publication on the doctrine of justification. As we've been working on uh, some of the initiatives with the Widener Institute, our, our goal has been twofold. One is to offer a number of courses and seminars that are available from a conventional Lutheran perspective for purchase, some of those being live courses that you could participate in, others being pre-recorded ones that you can purchase and watch afterwards and participate but we also uh, are engaging in theological publication, publication um, not just of, of classic Lutheran works, which we are doing through our Justin Center publishing, um, but these are our volumes that are new, uh, compilations of essays and some other scholarly materials as well. So uh, to kind of kick off those publications, we are going to be putting out a volume on justification as we see that as kind of the central, well, Lutheran teaching. We're all about the doctrine of justification. So we figure that's a great way to kind of launch this. So we have a series of essays that are coming out. It's eight essays on the doctrine of justification, interacting with uh, modern scholarship and debates in the church today surrounding the doctrine of justification coming from a, a confessionally Lutheran Lutheran perspective. So I'm really excited to get that out when that is released. I don't have a release date yet, but when that is released, we're going to be doing a number of programs on the doctrine of justification as well, going over some of the material. We're going to have some of the authors uh, of the essays in that volume coming on to discuss some of that too. But while I'm thinking about justification, that's what I'm going to be talking about today. So uh, as some of you know, if you've been listening to the program regularly, I began to work through a, a book by Robert Kuhns, uh, which is called A Lutheran's Case for Roman Catholicism, Finding a Lost Path Home, uh, by Robert C. Kuhns, who left the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod and joined the Roman Catholic Communion. So uh, Robert Kuhns, supposedly, I've, I've heard that he's going to be doing some kind of, of discussion or something like that uh, on some of the material that I put out on um, on his his work. So I wanted to continue this. I did two programs. The first was on justification, going through some of the material there. And then I, start, I went through his argument um, against Sola Scriptura. And I said before that I wanted to do more on, on the doctrine of justification as he explains it and give a defense of the Lutheran view. So initially, as I was setting up this, this program and thinking about what I wanted to talk about today, um, I, I wanted to go back and look at, you know, just continue his argument and look at essentially the question of what are the works of the law that Paul is talking about? And is he excluding any works whatsoever or just ceremonial works? And that is really key for not just the, the Roman Catholic position, but that's also key in, in Pauline scholarship today and a lot of debates with the new perspective on Paul and other things. Um, but as I was working my way through this and, and thinking through some of the things that I wanted to talk about there, I realized that there was something else that I felt like was a little more foundational to get out of the way before we got into that, the, the details of that. Uh, and that is what exactly is the Roman view of justification? Because this is something that I find uh, a lot in discussions about justification today with, with Roman Catholics, and especially those who are converting to Roman Catholicism that I've spoken with, and um, you know, people that, that, that I know that are listeners to my podcast or friends or whatever who have, who have joined the Roman uh, Church and, and think that there's a problem with the Lutheran understanding of justification, is when they've wrestled through these questions, they have heard answers from a lot of Roman apologists and contemporary theologians that resonate with the Pauline text in some some ways, but I would argue are not really consistent with where Rome was historically. And, and the idea is this, when you're talking to a lot of contemporary Roman Catholics and those who have, have joined the church, 
Oftentimes when you discuss particular texts about justification by faith, you'll, you'll find in discussion that people will grant that there is justification by faith alone. However, that's initial justification. And so they'll say, yeah, you're right that there is justification by faith alone, uh, but that's just initial justification and there's a final justification by works and there's the process of justification that follows that initial justification, if you want to use that terminology. And what that does is it allows the the Roman Catholic to grab onto like any major text, both biblical and patristic, that is going to be used to bolster the argument for the, the Lutheran position. And they're going to say, hey, this fits in the Roman system too. So it's not an argument for your position because, hey, we too believe this. It's just initial justification, not final justification, not this ongoing justification. It's something else. So that means that well, you know, when I grab onto a quote from Ambrose or I grab onto a quote from First Clement or, or from uh, John Chrysostom that, that say things like, well, pr pretty clearly articulate some form of a justification that is by faith without works and not just Jewish ceremonial works, but works whatsoever. And I say, hey, this sounds a lot like what Luther's saying. This sounds a lot like what Chemnitz is saying or what Gerhard is saying or what's outlined in the Book of Concord. This doesn't really seem to fit with the position of Trent. Uh, the response that I often get from Roman Catholics is, oh, that fits perfectly fine. So they, they grab onto, because that distinction between initial justification by faith alone and then a final justification that is by works uh, allows them to really say anything fits our system. So like any statement in the fathers that goes either direction, they can say, well, we can fit both of those in our system because we've got this justification and this justification. So our system is the most consistent with the fathers and our system is the most consistent with scripture because we know how to deal with all of the texts then. And what, what this ends up with in kind of just practical conversation is something that, that seems to be really similar to where the Reformed Church went on, on justification in some ways. And, you know, I think if you look at someone like, you know, Mark Jones and his book on antinomianism, how he outlines justification and, and the role of works in the final judgment, or if you look at some of the statements of John Piper or others, it, it appears to be pretty similar to um, what the Roman Catholics are saying from that perspective. If there really is this kind of initial justification by faith uh, that can even be said to be faith alone, and then there's this other justification that's ongoing or final justification that's different, that's not faith alone. Uh, well, you know, at that point... The question is like, what's the difference between Rome and, and the reformed position, say? So maybe there really isn't that much of a difference. And, you know, this is something that, you know, I, I've, as I have spent some time reading, well, the Council of Trent, right, the decrees of the canons of Trent, and as I've spent plenty of time reading Gerhard and Chemnitz and others that are interacting with the, the Roman Catholic position, and then looked at people like Bellarmine and, and what they're articulating, Bellarmine being the kind of foremost uh, polemicist in favor of, of Rome. Uh, so if you want to, so, so if, you know, if you want to see like the best arguments for Rome, Bellarmine is, is known for having the best arguments. So if you look at someone like Gerhard, or if you look at, you know, the, the reformed scholastics as well, getting into the 17th century, everyone interacts with Bellarmine because it's, it's understood. Bellarmine was, was brilliant. He knew his church history very well. He, if there are good arguments for Rome, he, he had the best that there were. So everyone interacts with Bellarmine. They understand, um, the, the importance of his writing. And what what I've noticed is that the arguments that people like Gerhard and, and the Reformed Scholastics as well, so the Lutheran and Reformed Scholastics make on justification, are opposing a position that is not exactly the position that is articulated by a lot of modern Roman Catholic apologists on justification. Because it was very clearly understood in the 17th century that there was no, there's no justification by faith alone. There, there's no initial justification by faith alone. That's not the Roman position. And it hasn't, it, it, it wasn't the Roman position at Trent. It is a way to address the challenges that the Reformation has posed to Trent so that contemporary Roman Catholics can grab onto this idea of this initial justification by faith alone as a way to say, hey, see, we believe this too. And now our system kind of fits anything you want to throw at it. And this is a problem with the, and I've said this before, this is a problem in my mind with the, the Roman system and the way that it develops. It, it formulates categories in such a way that it becomes impervious to critique, right? So if, you know, you point out, you know, all of the statements against, give, uh, you know, praying to anything other than God, as I pointed out, people like Origen, you know, there. The, this is pretty pretty clearly stated in some of the earliest fathers. Uh, we're talking about the issue of prayer to the saints. Well, well, 
they say, well, no, there's one kind of prayer and there's another kind of prayer. Uh, there's one kind of, uh, there's worship and then there's veneration. There's, um, you know, if, if you talk about uh, the mass and the sacrifice of Christ, well, no, those statements are just against a literal re-sacrifice, but we're talking about a representation of the sacrifice. That's something different. And and so the, the difficulty in challenging Rome, especially when you're going to the church fathers and you're going to, to scripture is, if you make enough distinctions ideologically and theologically, what you're doing is making so many distinctions that the position becomes unchallengeable, really, because you've you've argued your way a way that you are now consistent with the text by making a particular distinction that maybe wasn't there before. And, and so instead of saying, hey, no, the text actually fits our view, uh, then you say, well, actually, our view is, and then make a further distinction so that it can't be kind of toppled by those, those arguments. And it appears that something similar is happening with the doctrine of justification. Because it's, it's pretty clear when you read Bellarmine, when you read uh, the Trent, the canons of Trent, that they have an understanding that there, there is no justification by faith alone. Like, there, there just isn't. And that's not how they're expressing justification. Another issue that's going to come up is the question of assurance. This also changes very drastically. In the polemics, it, both in Luther's own lifetime and following Luther, it's very clear that the Roman Catholic Church, as post-Trent, takes the position that one cannot have assurance that they are in a state of grace. There is no assurance that you are in a state of grace. And that's stated all over the place. Now, today, when I look at the way that, that Rome, Roman apologists particularly express themselves, they, they do speak about, yeah, of course you can have assurance that you're in a state of grace. Like you go to confession, you participate in the sacramental life of the church, yes, you're in a state of grace. What we're really talking about is you don't have any, when we say that you can't have assurance, you don't have any absolute assurance that you're going to persevere to the end. You know, of course, you can't have that kind of 100% absolute assurance. And okay, well, that sounds much more reasonable because technically, does any of us know with 100% assurance that we're going to persevere to the end? Well, I don't know. So uh, so they say, look, so we're not really that different from you, right? So um, you even see this in the the critiques that, I, that I've that i looked at from, um, you know, SSPX and some of these SSPX priests dealing with the Reformation is they criticize specifically the Reformed Church for their, their view of kind of looking inward for assurance. And they say, oh, that's a horrible place to put yourself in, to say that you can't have any assurance. And, and what they end up doing is basically coming to a, a Lutheran conclusion and giving a Lutheran answer to these questions, <laughs> which I find funny, but uh, which I'm glad like they do. And, and I'm, I'm not saying that, you know, I wish Rome would go back to what Trent taught. But what I'm trying to demonstrate is just that there is not consistency between what you hear today and what was taught officially by the church at the Council of Trent in response to the Reformation. So it was the Tridentine view that you cannot have assurance that you're in a state of grace. It's, it's not the Tridentine view that you can have assurance that you're in a state of grace. It's just that you, you can't, unless you have a supernatural revelation, of course, you can't know that you're going to be finally saved. Um, but generally, you can know, yeah, that you're in a state of grace now if you're repentant and things like that. It, that's not the Roman view. It, it, it was not the Roman view. And what you see is there is this there's just this ever-shifting perspective in, in Rome which takes away the appeal of this consistency of the church. It just simply isn't there. And I think that's demonstrable in so many ways. And of course, you come up with excuses for that too, because all of a sudden, even though Trent is very clear that there is, uh, that, that it is it is the belief of the Council of Trent that what is taught at Trent is the unanimous consensus of the fathers. It's not. It's demonstrably not. So what happens is Newman develops the development hypothesis that now, well, now the church is impervious to any historical argument against it because it just says, well, that doctrine just didn't develop yet because now you have the development hypothesis. They're the seeds of the doctrine. So what Rome has done is, as I've said, it makes itself impervious to any critique because of the categories that it creates. That's why you can look at Chemnitz's entire four-volume examination of the Council of Trent where he demonstrates so much inconsistency between Trent and the fathers of the church. And then Coons can just, in like a couple sentences, be like, oh, hey, but there's this whole development of doctrine thing, so it doesn't matter. 
you know, th this is what's so frustrating with, with dealing with these things. So uh, what I want to do now is just jump into the canons of Trent and read them and say, what does Trent actually teach? And I did some of this with Vatican I, Papal Infallibility, because again, that's another doctrine that is completely explained away because Vatican I very clearly teaches Papal Infallibility when the Pope is speaking in the chair of Peter authoritatively, um, whatever the Pope says is infallible according to, to Vatican I. And if you look at the debates surrounding Vatican I, the controversy surrounding it, it's very clear that that has a very broad interpretation of what that means. Um, nowadays, it's often just kind of excused to say, well, that only is in very unique circumstances and the Pope has used it like once or twice. So that's it. That's all we're saying is that it's possible in very rare circumstances every once in a while for the Pope to say, hey, I'm bringing in a dogma ex cathedra and that's it. Uh, clearly not what Vatican I is saying. It's complete inconsistency. But when you start... You know, the, pap the doctrine of papal infallibility is just another example of one of these doctrines that's extremely difficult to defend historically. Because you can look at Pope Honorius, you can look at, you know, there, there are so many examples of popes clearly teaching things that are contradictory or teaching things even authoritatively that the church has then changed its view on. Um, you know, for example, I've pointed out Exerge Domine, which speaks about the killing of heretics. The current pope doesn't believe that, well, in the death penalty at all, and he's made statements like this. How do these two things fit together? Well, you either explain away Exerge Domine that it doesn't mean what it obviously says, or you start saying things like, well, that's not really an infallible document. And now that becomes elastic. So who knows what's infallible? Well, if there's a contradiction, that's just not an infallible document. If there's a contradiction between popes. Well, they weren't a true pope. They were an anti-pope. You, you see, you have all of these kind of escape routes so that no matter what contradiction you point out, no matter what argument you make, there's always a way out. And, and so the system is so frustrating because of that um, to, to really engage with. And, and what I see in the era post-Trent is that it wasn't that way. Like you could say, hey, this is the view. This is what the fathers are saying. And then we come back and say, no, this is what the fathers are saying. This is our view. And we can battle it out, right? Like, but but the problem is that the, the categories have become so loose that it's like there, there's no room for even discussing things because there's always just a kind of easy way out without actually engaging the text or the sources. All right, so let's jump into some of the things that are taught uh, in the canons of Trent itself. All right, so I'm going to be reading from um, the canons of Trent here. I am going to be reading um, an English translation which is the one on New Advent and other places. I mean, you can find this um, all over the place online. Uh, and yes, I've checked the, the Latin text. I'm not gonna be reading directly from the Latin here, but if, if there is a question about something that's, that someone says, you know, hey, the Latin doesn't clearly say this, I'll go back and, and I can look at it um, there just to see, to, to be sure that I'm representing it accurately as it was originally written. All right. So we're going to look at the, the canons of the Council of Trent. So the Council of Trent being formed to respond to the Reformation, the foundation of the, the Counter-Reformation uh, within Rome. And so there are all these statements about justification. And in this, in, in this section, you have um, some chapters, some little paragraphs that explain some specifics, but then you have the canons, and the canons are really just these kind of concise one sentence type of, of statements that explain what what the doctrine of justification is according to Trent. Now, I've seen people read the canons who ha were kind of from a very anti-Roman Catholic kind of maybe Baptist background or something, and they say, oh, it talks all about grace. This isn't like Pelagianism. Uh, and then they're like, okay, it's all about grace. There's really not that much different between Rome and then the Protestant perspective. And, um, you know, it, it's true that when you look at the canons of Trent, it, it's not Pelagian. Like that's just, that's not a fair representation. And it's true that there have been plenty of completely inaccurate Protestant uh, explanations of, of Trent or of Roman Catholicism generally. And we have to be careful not to give into those caricatures. So it's not like the canons of Trent are going to be, everything that they say is going to be like completely against you know, anything orthodox, certainly Trent speaks about the necessity of grace. Trent is actually going to reject some of the same things that Luther himself rejected, that there was this kind of Neo-Pelagianism, uh, the Neo-Pelagiani, uh, as uh, I believe it was uh, was a Gregory of Rimini who, who used that term. But um, those who kind of revived this idea that even apart from the grace of God, by human natural powers, you can fulfill the law of God perfectly. Like, 
Trent's going to reject that. I mean, that's that that's literal Pelagianism. Trent is not Pelagian, okay? But that doesn't mean Trent is in agreement with with the Lutheran view, certainly. So there, there are going to be areas of difference. So what I want to do is outline what the actual differences are. What are the actual differences? Because we can't get to any real discussion, we can't get to any real debate without identifying what the differences are. And this is what's so frustrating is I like to have a clear system where you can stand, you know, next to somebody and say, hey, this is where we're, these are the perspectives we're taking. This is our doctrine. They say, this is our doctrine and let's kind of figure it out. And the kind of loose way that things are interpreted today is what makes this so frustrating. Um, so, okay. Now, I, I don't want to read through, I'm not going to have time to read through every single thing in here, but uh, I want to read a little bit of chapter nine against the vain confidence of heretics. So specifically, they're dealing with the question of, um, or with the topic of assurance, uh, because w within the, the teaching of the Reformation, the Lutheran Reformation, it's the idea that that there is assurance that if you believe, if you truly believe in true faith, that your sins are forgiven for Christ's sake, they are they are actually forgiven because you're trusting in Christ for the forgiveness of sins. Your sins are actually forgiven, and you can actually know that you are in a state of grace. Um, and I want to read the the final section, of, final sentence of this paragraph here. And again, you can find this online, so you can read it yourself in context too. For as no pious person ought to doubt the mercy of God, the merit of Christ, and the virtue and efficacy of the sacraments. Okay, so I want to say, you know, it, it, they're not saying, hey, you can't know anything about the grace of God. So they're saying, yes, as a as a Christian, we know that God is gracious. We trust in the merit of Christ. We trust in the efficacy of the sacraments. Um, we trust in all of those things. We understand that. But then let's look more at what it says after this. So each one, when he considers himself and his own weakness and indisposition, may have fear and apprehension concerning his own grace, since no one can know with the certainty of faith, which cannot be subject to error, that he has obtained the grace of God. That's really key here, because the argument that I often see today is, of course, you can be sure that you're in a state of grace. You just can't be sure of your final perseverance. That is demonstrably not what Trent is saying. So they're saying you can have, there, there's kind of this general trust and knowledge of God's gracious character, but when you look at your your own self, yourself, and you look at your own disposition, in your own heart, you cannot actually be sure that you have obtained a state of grace. Not that you will obtain it in the future or will retain it, but according to Trent, the problem with the reformers and their view of assurance is that you can have assurance that you have currently obtained the grace of God. So that kind of assurance is really not available there which leads you to this state of introspection, looking at inside and saying, did I really obtain the grace of God? And you're looking at your internal dispositions as is stated by Trent. So that's really key. And that's a major difference. If you believe that you can have assurance apart from some supernatural revelation, that you are in a state of grace, you're not being consistent with Trent. And I think most Roman Catholics that I know are not consistent with Trent because they know they're in a state of grace. They trust in the sacraments. They trust in the word of God, which is good, but but they're not being consistent with what Trent says. And, and this has just shifted so much, I think, today. Well, what I want to do now is move down to the canons and, you know, I, we could look at every single thing written here, but I don't want to want to do all of that because there just won't be out of time. Okay, so let's look at canon one first. If anyone says that man cannot be can be justified by God, by his own works, whether done by his own natural powers or through the teaching of the law, without the divine grace through Jesus Christ, let him be anathema. Again, so really clearly here, Trent does, it is stating its agreement. Like it's stating that, yeah, there, there's agreement. And it's true, there is agreement between Rome and, and uh, the Lutheran tradition on this point. And we have to rightly say, hey, this is an area where we agree. This is great that, hey, we're all, none of us believe that you can by your pure, purely through your own natural powers or you just by like hearing the teaching of the law, uh, without the grace of Christ, you can just fulfill the law and save yourself. Like, of course you can't do that, okay? So uh, Trent clearly rejects Pelagianism. That's good. Great area of agreement, good to establish that. Uh, an important point. Canon two, if anyone says that divine grace through Christ Jesus is given for this only, that man may be able to more easily live justly and to merit eternal life as if by free will without grace, he is able to do both, though with hardship and difficulty, let him be anathema. Again, so this is to say that divine grace is not just a kind of a little bit of a help or an aid to make things 
easier for you to merit eternal life for yourself. Another clear rejection of, of the Pelagian perspective, Canon 3. If anyone says that without the predisposing inspiration of the Holy Ghost and without his help, man can believe, hope, love, or be repentant as he ought, so that the grace of justification may be bestowed on him, let him be anathema. Again, really, really important point. This gets even more specific, which is to say that the Holy Spirit is necessary that that we can believe. There has to be some kind of work of the Holy Spirit in order for us to uh, to believe. So the Roman position is not semi-Pelagian. You're not going to find, you know, latent flowers uh, being consistent with Trent. Uh, the, the perspective of grace that you find in Trent is closer to a Reformation approach than what you find in latent flowers. Uh, and, and I know that will be strange to some, but it's true. Like the, we, it is important to say that there are these really key areas of agreement. And, you know, I, you know, I'm one when I, when I look at other traditions, I want to say like, where is it that we agree? I, I want to know where we agree. And I think we should celebrate places where we agree. But once we do that, then we have to identify, okay, what really are the key differences? And these are important points. Rome has rejected semi-Pelagianism. It has rejected both Pelagianism and semi-Pelagianism. There is a necessity of the internal work of the Holy Spirit in order for one to believe in Rome, according to Trent. Now, that becomes a kind of cooperative effort, so it's not exactly the same as a kind of monergistic conversion as you find in the Lutheran or Reformed traditions, but there is some kind of internal grace um, that's, that is there. Okay. Now, let's move on. Canon 4. If anyone says that man's free will moved and aroused by God by assenting to God's call and action in no way cooperates toward disposing and preparing itself to obtain the grace of justification that it cannot refuse the assent if it wishes, but that as something inanimate, it does nothing whatever and is merely passive, let him be anathema. So here is going to be really the major point of disagreement. Um, as it starts, right? Here's going to be, this is a, a rejection of both the Lutheran and Reformed reformers who are going to make the argument. So both, you know, both Luther and Calvin are going to make the argument that um, free will does not play a role in one receiving the grace of, of justification. And that, that language of being merely passive or pure passivity, that's language that Luther himself uses. So the, the canon here states that, that the grace of God does act first, right? So it's not semi-Pelagian. Uh, but it is saying that our free will is moved by God, but there is a human assent or an assent of our free will to God's call and action, and that we cooperate and dispose or prepare ourselves to obtain the grace of justification. So here, the idea is not just that, you know, my free will cooperates in sanctification, uh, which is certainly going to be the case with very clearly the, the uh, formula of Concord within the Lutheran Church. We're, we're going to say that, I mean, confessionally, we're bound to say that we cooperate with the grace of God in sanctification. It's a cooperative work. Uh, so that there is, we are synergistic in that sense. We are synergistic in that because the because the free will has been freed, right? We are not admonished to sin. We are now slaves to Christ. That our will, as it, it has been changed by the gifting of the Spirit, as our affections and desires have been changed, now we can and do cooperate with God in the work of sanctification, but that's not justification. So that our conversion, in our conversion, we are purely passive. So our initial entrance into the faith has, has nothing whatsoever to do with our free will. God does it. It's solely his work. Our final salvation is solely his work as well. Uh, because we're also going to, to make the point that justification is not just a past tense conversion reality. It's a daily reality. And justification is always sola fide. It's always the grace of God alone. It's never something we cooperate in. But our life in this world of sanctification is something we cooperate in. So we have to make make that important distinction. So here, even when we're talking about, what, if you're going to talk about initial justification in, in the Roman perspective, that is a work that is cooperative. So even to initially receive the grace of God, though God does inspire us and to, to do it, so it's not semi-Pelagian, we do have to actually assent and cooperate in order to be converted. So there is a necessity of assent and cooperation and human willing in conversion itself. So even in the initial justification, we have to do something. So it is it is uh, synergistic. And it, it's on that point that I, that I do think we can make an argument that Augustine 
has a perspective that is not the same as Trent. But that's a that's another discussion. <laughs> so, but I do think that if we look at Augustine and we look at Prosper of Aquitaine and we do look at Fulgentius of Rusp and we do look at uh, Caesarius of Arles, these early kind of more predestinarian figures, uh, I, I do think the way they speak about conversion is inconsistent with Trent. And, and I, I think that gives us a pretty clear line to say, okay, here's an area where we disagree. Uh, and here's the Lutheran view, here's the Roman view, let's go back and look at the church fathers and what they say, and I think we can find people actually on both sides. It is certainly not clear that just the Roman view is the patristic view. We, we can see people on, on different sides in that particular discussion. Okay, so Gregory the Great would be would be a good example of someone who has basically the view that's outlined at Trent. And Gregory the Great is a, I mean, he's called the Great for a reason, like he's a great uh, pastor and theologian. He's got some pretty weird ideas though, and he does kind of modify Augustine's view to what we see in Trent. Uh, but even Luther was actually spoke very highly of Gregory the Great. He, he called him the last the last good pope. Uh, and that was like 600 AD. So it does see what he thought of the popes, like pretty much all the popes uh, until his time. Um, but yeah, anyway, so okay. So I think that's uh, that that really does help to put in perspective what is the difference um, between the, the, the Roman perspective and the one of um, both the Lutheran and Reformed uh, Protestant traditions. Okay, um, let's see. So there's no mere passivity in conversion. So we have to be active in our conversion. Then Canon 5, if anyone says that after the sin of Adam, man's free will was lost and destroyed, or that it is the thing only in name, indeed a name without a reality, a fiction introduced into the church by Satan, let him be anathema. The language here is from the bondage of the will. Uh, so it, the, the language here is a rejection specifically of Luther's language in the bondage of the will. Now, I will say, too, Luther was a little bit extreme in the way that he phrased things. And Trent doesn't really portray the perspective in like in all of its nuance at all. Because what it seems to portray is that, oh, hey, the, you know, the Lutherans are saying that that's it. The only thing you could say about free will is that it completely doesn't exist at all and there's no reality to it whatsoever. What do we mean by free will? So, and Trent doesn't outline this too clearly what it's saying here, but if what you're saying is that the human person is just coerced to do everything they do, then no, it's wrong in, in, in portraying it that way. If what you mean though, is that there is no free will in a spiritual sense so that man in sin because of Adam's fall cannot do that which is spiritually good and needs to be changed by the spirit in order to do that which is good if you're if that's what Trent is projecting which is really what the reformers believe so if it's being accurate to what the reformers believe um then that that leads a, a problem uh and and I think that you know I, I think that what we need to do is look at things like the Augsburg Confession which are the official teachings of the Lutheran Church where we see that when we're speaking about free will, Melanchthon makes the distinction that what we're saying is, first of all, there is free will in things below us. We're not talking about, you know, humans being forced to do everything they do. We're not saying that, you know, I, I don't have the free will to pick which coffee mug I'm going to grab in the morning. As I have my Cafe Nervosa Frasier coffee mug. Um, I picked this mug because I like this mug a lot. This is probably my favorite mug that I have. I had a Piet Mondrian mug that I used all the time and that I broke. But so this is the one that I use uh, most of the time. Anyway, so I picked that. I like it. I chose it. That was my free will. It's true. No one forced me to do that. Uh, that's But that is what the Lutherans will categorize as things below us. So just regular earthly things. What we're talking about is free will and spiritual things. Scripture, because it says we are bound to sin, if that's what we're talking about, then we don't have free will. Or, or think about you know Luther's famous illustration, which doesn't come from Luther, by the way, but where he speaks about the devil riding us. Like we're like a horse, right? The devil rides us like a horse and we go wherever he wants. Um, that, and that's, that's our state in sin. That illustration actually comes from St. Prosper of Aquitaine. It's a, it's a patristic illustration. It's not like Luther is, is innovating here. So it is, at least if that's what Rome is rejecting, they are rejecting part of the patristic tradition. Now, they can say that part of the patristic tradition is wrong, certainly, but it is there. And there are, by the way, popes who affirm this. So that's a, that's a whole other discussion. But uh, there, there was a pope who affirmed this view in Prosper and in Augustine on the will 
as the Catholic view. Okay, let's let's move on. But of course, someone could defend this and just say, hey, what Trent is rejecting is really just this extreme view that free will doesn't exist at all. And yeah, I mean, we should all reject that because, okay. Uh, <laughs> if you look at the bondage of the will, you have to ask like, well, what context is Luther talking in? Because it's true that in just this broad sense, free will does, you know, we can't just throw out free will altogether. You just say, well, in what sense? And Luther, by the way, like affirms what Melanchthon says when he makes these clarifications. You know, he approves the Augsburg Confession. So uh, I think Luther simply is just using the term in a different way to talk about a completely different thing than, than Melanchthon was then talking about and making these distinctions. Okay. Canon 6, if anyone says that it is not in man's power to make his ways evil, but that works that are evil as well as those that are good, God produces not permissively only, but propria et per se, so that the treason of Judas is no less his own proper work than the vocation of St. Paul, let him be anathema. Um, so that kind of idea is really more dealing with Calvinism and Lutheranism, so I'm not too concerned with that. Um, the idea of God being like like active in human sin, um, that's addressed in the Augsburg Confession. It's very clear in the Augsburg Confession that we attribute sin to the, the twisted human will, not to, to God. So We'll leave that aside. That's kind of, we'll let the Calvinists deal with that one. Okay, Canon 7. If anyone says that all the works done before justification, in whatever manner they may be done, are truly sins or merit the hatred of God, that the more earnestly one strives to dispose himself for grace, the more grievously he sins, let him be anathema. This is, I think, a really key canon here. And you see this disagreement in, in Luther's writings. Uh, and in a lot of people like Eck, who are arguing with Luther, um, or Latimus, who argues against Luther, or Cajetan, they all grab on to this, this idea that Luther says that apart from faith, everything is sin, which is basically, by the way, St. Paul says this. And, and to say that there is no, there is no good work apart from grace, the grace of God. Everything is a sin. And this is an area where I really don't think that Trent's view can be defensible scripturally uh, to say that because when we're talking about humanity we're either in a state of sin in bondage to sin that's the language that scripture uses or we are in bondage to Christ we are, we are slaves to Christ and you know that which is born of flesh is flesh that which is born of spirit is spirit and there there is just so much scripturally that teaches this if you are not in Christ, if you are not renewed by the Spirit, you cannot do that which is spiritually good. Without faith, you cannot please God. This is what Paul says. So the position that Rome puts itself in here is to say that you can do truly good works even without faith. Well, Luther makes the point that, you know, think about the, the Ten Commandments. The first commandment becomes the foundation of the others. Proper love of God is the foundation by which we we do anything good this is why it, it starts the commandments we fear love and trust god so that this is how he explains in the small catechism the various the various commandments because that love and trust of god starts is the foundation of all good uh, the fear of the lord is the beginning of wisdom as proverb says over and over again what rome ends up coming to here if you're going to be consistent with the canons of trent is a position that says that you can do good apart from Christ. You can do good apart from faith. You can do good apart from fear of the Lord. And it just, it does not, it's not a scriptural position. It's just not. So I think that really is a key point that we want to grab onto if we're looking at what are the differences between a Reformation perspective and a Roman perspective is, is this canon. Uh, I think that's a really, really clear distinguishing point. So yeah, when I, when I see this here, I, I just don't see it as biblical. Now, I, I do think we want to make a distinction, okay? So when we're talking about unbelievers, what we're not saying because this is going to be the misinterpretation, right? That every single thing an unbeliever does is is just only evil. What we what we have to do when we're talking about good works from a non-Christian, distinguish between civic righteousness and then spiritual righteousness. Okay. So it 
it is simply true that there is plenty of civic good in non-believers. So, so we're not saying that nothing a non-believer does is good or beneficial toward anybody ever. And it's just only evil all the time. What we're saying is, and we're talking about the perspective of before God and God's judgment and his law, faith is the first requirement. And so if there is no faith behind the act, there is no proper internal disposition, there's no proper affection that is rooting the act, then it is sin in that sense. If you're speaking about the strict standards of God's law, it is sin. And by the way, the strict standards of God's law condemn us as Christians and our sin too. So that <laughs> it's not like it's just unbelievers, but, um, but we're not saying that there is no civic good. So what we're doing is distinguish between these two realms. There is our righteousness before others and our righteousness before God. So we're speaking about our righteousness before others in this world, civically, you know, in terms of like development of, of virtue and um, kindness shown toward others in this world. Of course, it's there's plenty of good that is done by non-Christians. But if we're speaking about the sense of sin before God, if you are not performing an act in faith, it is sin. Like scripture seems to be pretty clear about that. So if that's the case, Trent is wrong here. And, and I think that's a really key point. All right, so Canon 8. If anyone says that the fear of hell, whereby grieving for sins, we flee to the mercy of God or abstain from sinning is a sin, makes sinners worse, let him be anathema. Okay, um, so if, if it's speaking about just this idea that our own, the only reason we flee to God is because we are afraid of hell. And I don't think I want to spend much time on that because I don't think that's, that's that key. Canon 9, though. If anyone says that the sinner is justified by faith alone, meaning that nothing else is required to cooperate in order to obtain the grace of justification, pretty clear, and that it is not in any way necessary that he be prepared and disposed by the action of his own will, let him be anathema. This seems like a really obvious point here and very clearly stated that there is no justification by faith alone for Trent. Even initial justification is not by faith alone. You cannot obtain the grace of, you cannot say that you can obtain the grace of justification by faith alone, but that there has to be good inwardly and proper disposition of the will and these kinds of things in order to obtain the grace of justification. So when people are saying that, yes, there's this initial justification by faith alone, and that that's different from this final justification, which is not by faith alone, or the process of justification, which is not by faith alone. That is not the Roman view. There are plenty of Roman Catholics who believe it, and like I'm not mad that they believe it. Like I, I think they're right. <laughs> that I'm glad. Like I'm glad that they can grab onto a form of sola fide, but it's not the historic Roman view. Like they're they're actually agreeing with the reformers over and against the Council of Trent when they make those claims. Um, so that's going to be really key, I think, when we get a little bit more into Robert Kuhn's argument as we, we delve into this further. But that's also really key when we are looking at the church fathers. So when we examine things like First Clement, when he speaks about a justification, clearly justification by faith alone, that if, if Trent's view is what Trent says, <laughs> what I'm saying that Trent says and what it does say, if that's Trent, then if we can prove that First Clement, for example, teaches justification by faith alone. It's irrelevant whether there is a final justification that is not by faith alone or not. If there is any justification by faith alone in Clement, First Clement, and I'm just using that as an example, but we can look at plenty of other places as well. If that is proven, that is agreement with the Reformation over and against Rome. And it shows that there is, at least in these early sources, which I've made the argument for in the past, there is a precedent for the Reformation view. It doesn't say it agrees on every particular, but it doesn't agree on every particular with Trent either. So if I'm correct in interpreting Trent in this way, which appears to be the way that Bellarmine and everybody else seems to have interpreted Trent, um, or else when you read the arguments of like every Lutheran or Reformed scholastic, they're being completely incoherent and inconsistent with what they're arguing against. Or they don't really understand the argument because they pretty clearly read Trent the way I do too. And all of the interlocutors read Trent the way I do here. Um, so if, if I'm correct here, then this lays a really important groundwork for how we're going to approach 
the epistles of Paul, and how we're going to approach the fathers, because it's going to shift the questions. So where so many modern Roman Catholics want to just say, okay, well, it doesn't matter if they say justification by faith alone. What you really have to prove is that justification by faith alone, not just in the beginning, but throughout life and eschatological justification by faith alone. We don't actually have to prove that to prove that Rome is wrong because Trent says something very different. There is no justification by faith alone at all. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, so that's that's important. All right, Canon 10, if anyone says that men are justified without the justice of Christ or without the righteousness of Christ, whereby he merited for us or that by that justice are formally just, let them be anathema. So this is, this is again, a really good clarification that shows that there is an important area of agreement. Trent is clearly not saying that we can be justified apart from the righteousness of Christ. So they're saying like, yo, we agree with the reformers that there's justification by the righteousness of Christ, but not that alone. So it's good that they're saying that. That's important. That's a really key area of agreement. Again, Rome is not purely Pelagian. Canon 11. If anyone says that men are justified either by the sole imputation of the justice of Christ, so either the imputation of Christ's righteousness or by the sole remission of sins to the exclusion of the grace and charity which is poured forth in their hearts by the Holy Ghost, and remains in them, or also that the grace by which we are justified is only the good will of God, let him be anathema. All right, so what this is doing here is speaking about the necessity of the grace that justifies being that which is infused in the soul, not the, the favor of God. So in, in this is what, it, especially at the end here, that the grace by which we are justified is only the goodwill of God. Now, I want to make a clarification here that when the reformers do speak about the grace of God being divine favor, the favor dei, the favor of God, they are not saying that that's all that grace is in scripture. It's very clear that the kind of language of, of gift is connected with grace in the New Testament throughout. And the reformers all recognize this. They all talk about this. Luther knows this. Luther says this all the time. But that's not justification, right? So we, what we have to recognize is it's not that there's no internal grace. It's not that we don't receive the gift of the Spirit and we're not changed internally, but that that's not the basis for our justification. So I am not justified based on an internal righteousness that I am given that changes me. So what Canon 11 is saying here is that so we are justified, it's rejecting the idea that we are justified by either Christ's righteousness being imputed or the forgiveness of sins only, but that there is grace and charity which is given in our hearts by the Holy Spirit that results in justification. So we are justified by the infusion of something internal to us which is grace and charity, which you speak about the faith formed by love, right? So faith justifies insofar as it is formed by love, not by, not by faith alone. So that does, again, give us another really clear standard to say, does this agree with the Roman view or does it agree with the Lutheran view? Is it that justification is by something that is internal to the person or an infusion of charity and love, or is it just by what Christ has done? All right, so that's that gives us, I think, a really clear uh, place to then look at Paul and look at the fathers and say, like, where, where are they going with this? Okay, Canon 12. If anyone says that justifying faith is nothing else than confidence in divine mercy, which remits sins for Christ's sake, that it is confidence alone that justifies us, let him be anathema. Okay, again, this is there is no justification by faith alone for Rome because this idea that confidence in the mercy of God remits sins alone, if that justifies us, that's wrong, according to, to Trent. And, you know, I think that there's plenty of evidence in Paul that this is the case, that, that he believes that trusting in God's mercy does result in the forgiveness of sins. <laughs> um, and, I mean, there certainly are plenty of quotes in the Fathers that say things like, trusting in God's mercy gives you the forgiveness of sins. Uh, without anything else, like without having to do anything, uh, according to Trent, that is that is position is anathema. Canon 13, if anyone says that in order to obtain the remission of sins, it is necessary for every man to believe with certainty without any hesitation arising from his own weakness and indisposition, 
that his sins are forgiven, um, let him be anathema. So this is the, the question of going back to the question of, of certainty in salvation. So um, it, it, I'm going to say this. It, it's not that in, this does come up in some kind of later Puritan debates, not within a Lutheran tradition, though. But um, it's not that you have to have 100% certainty that you're saved or else you're not saved. Because that then turns faith into a kind of work, and and you know you're adding certainty to faith as a quality of faith that you have to have, uh, and, and that's not correct. Okay, so if if that's what Trent is rejecting, it's right to reject that idea. But I, I think what is more key here is that what Trent is going against is this idea that you really have can have confidence in the grace of God, in confidence of your state of grace. Uh, and this is why there is mention of our own weakness and indisposition, so that our own inherent weakness and our indisposition, our improper dispositions, that leads to, according to Trent, and should lead to some kind of doubt about our salvation, which is a bad position to put yourself in. Okay, Canon 14. If anyone says that... Um, okay, here. Yeah, if anyone says that man is absolved from his sins and justified... Because he firmly believes that he is absolved and justified, so this is clearly rejecting what's in the Augsburg Confession, or that no one is truly justified except him who believes himself justified, and by this faith alone, absolution and justification are effected. Let him be anathema. Okay, so if you if you uh, believe that you are justified and if you're forgiven of your sins because you trust and believe that such is the case in Christ, you trust in Christ for the forgiveness of sins. If you believe that that affects justification and absolution, you are anathema. So again, there is no place for an initial justification by faith alone here. That That's anathema, according to Trent. Canon 15. If anyone says that a man who was born again and justified is bound ex fide to believe that he is certainly in the number of the predestined, let him be anathema. Um, so this is the this probably is more connected to, to Calvin's idea, so I'm going to kind of leave that aside as, as, again, the Reformed can battle that one out. Canon 16, if anyone says that he will for certain, with an absolute and infallible certainty, have that great gift of perseverance even to the end, unless he shall have learned this by special revelation, let him be anathema. So here's where modern Roman Catholics often, this is what they often grab onto to say that, well, what we're really rejecting is this idea that you have absolute 100% infallible certainty that you are going to persevere to the end. And uh, you no, you can't have that. And it's true that I don't think in any system you can really have that. We all kind of want that. Um, but so for, for the Lutheran, for our position, you can fall away from the faith. So can we have confidence and trust that we are indeed going to persevere and trust in God and his persevering work? Absolutely, 100%. But can I say that with an infallible 100% certainty? There's no way to do that. Even from a Reformed perspective, you have the same thing because you have the same que the question of, well, how do I know that I'm elect or that my faith is genuine faith? Because you may say, well, everyone who has faith is going to persevere, so therefore you can know with 100% certainty. Well, can you really know with 100% certainty that your faith is genuine? Not really. Not really. So none of us are really going to come to that, that position. So if that was all that Rome was rejecting in terms of the question of assurance, it wouldn't be that big of a deal, but that's not all that they're rejecting as we see from the other explanations here at, at Trent. As well as, again, how this was understood by other uh, Roman theologians. Canon 17, if anyone says that the grace of justification is shared by those only who are predestined to life, but all others who are called are called indeed, but receive not grace, as if they are by divine power predestined to evil, let them be anathema. Double predestination, so that's not really a reference to our position. Canon 18, if anyone says that the commandments of God are, even for the one that is justified and constituted in grace, impossible to observe, let him be anathema. Well, what, yeah, and I guess this this is a little vague because it depends on what you mean by that. Do you mean that, that it is possible for a human to completely observe every commandment of God perfectly? You know, that we would say, no. Are you saying that there is no obedience to the commands at all for a Christian? Uh, certainly we would say yes. So we believe, though, that we are saints and sinners so that, that our weakness that is in the sinful flesh does not allow for perfect obedience to God's commands, even in the life of the regenerate. Um, but that, that's a little vague there in the way that it's worded, so it's not, it's not quite clear. 
can of 24, and we're almost done here. Okay. Let's see. If anyone says that justice is not preserved and also not increased before God through good works, but that those works are merely fruits and signs of justification obtained, not a cause of its increase, let it be anathema. So this is an, an affirmation of the idea that, that um, righteousness is not uh, something that is imputed. It's not a state that we are in. It is something that is internal and increases in us. So our good works do play a role in justification. They increase our justification. So our righteousness can be increased by our good works. And that good works are not merely fruits or signs of a salvation that we receive, but are actually affecting that salvation itself actively. Um, okay, clear distinction here. If anyone says, Canon 30, that after the reception of the grace of justification, the guilt is so remitted, and the debt of eternal punishment so blotted out, that no temporal no debt of temporal punishment remains to be discharged before the gates of heaven can be opened. Let him be anathema. Um, and that is really dealing with the question of purgatory. Now, is this, it, we can expand upon that a little bit too, because are you saying that, what do you mean that there are no temporal punishments? Are you saying that there are no temporal consequences of sins? Because that's just not true. <laughs> uh, and the, the Luther Confessions do deal with this. The Apology of the Oxford Confession especially deals with this. So there, it is true that there is, there is like there are temporal consequences to sins, but does God have to uh, punish us? Does He have to punish us in order for us to obtain the grace of of well being in His presence, the beatific vision? Um, do we have to suffer some kind of temporal punishment, whether it's purgatory or something else, in order to, in order to get there? That is simply not a biblical conception at all. So, and and I would argue that it's not a patristic one either. But again, I could point that out and show that it's not a patristic conception, but then you just, you know, say, hey, development hypothesis, so it doesn't matter anyway. Um, <laughs> I don't know. Well, um, that's all that I really wanted to address here in the Council of Trent. I, I just thought it was really important to go to Trent and say, what exactly it does Trent say? Because when we get into these dialogues about justification, we have to be clear, what is the Roman tradition? So that when, when someone says, oh, hey, yeah, I can affirm justification by faith alone. It's just initial justification. That we know that, hey, that's actually a Protestant position. It's not a Roman position. And you're being consistent with your own tradition. Now, again, I've said this. I'm thankful that this is changing. I'm glad that they're coming to a position, which I think is a more biblical position. It's not like I want Roman Catholics to all be afraid of their salvation and worry that they're not in a state of grace all the time. Um, you know, I, I, I'm glad that that's shifted, but it's not consistent with the tradition itself. So when I hear people kind of jumping to Rome, which just happens just constantly these days, um, because they think that they found the consistent church, it's, it's not, it's just not. And, and contemporary Roman Catholics, I've even heard SSPX, like the traditionalists, uh, disagree with what's clearly in the canons of Trent itself. No, they tend to be a lot more consistent with Trent, uh, the traditionalist Catholics, the most extreme ones, than you know than a lot of modern Roman Catholics. But even even then, I see elements of really grabbing onto the the Protestant perspective in many ways. So, with all of that groundwork being laid, I th I just think that's so essential to get what is Trent saying, why does this differ from the Lutheran view, and then we can delve into the rest of Kuhn's arguments and look at the epistles of Paul and say, do they really fit with the Tridentine perspective? And ultimately, I think that we are going to see that it doesn't fit with the Tridentine perspective. And also, there are plenty of church fathers that don't agree with the Tridentine perspective. That's not to say that they don't, that they agree 100% with everything that someone like Martin Luther said. It's They don't, but they also don't 100% agree with Trent either. Uh, and we can find statements that are kind of all over the place on these questions. And so it's not a matter of saying, well, one side is consistent with the fathers and the other side isn't. The question is much more complicated and complex than that. Well, I hope you enjoyed this and found this helpful in outlining some of these issues and outlining what some of these differences are. And uh, I do look forward to hearing from you all, especially I know my Roman Catholic listeners and viewers are, will have plenty to say about this, which you always do. So it's always uh, I'm always interested to see what you have to say as well. And um, I'm also just kind of curious as to where this came from, this idea of initial justification within the Roman perspective, 
which isn't a historic one here, though I will say that there are some people at the Council of Trent, even though it didn't end up in the canons of Trent, there are people that argued for a position like that, but that didn't become the official position. So I, I am curious. I think some people, you know, it, it may have started with Newman and I'm, I'm very curious if Newman is the root of that, um, just like with the development hypothesis. And, and I know he's a really key figure in so many ways. So um, anyway, if you haven't subscribed to this uh, on YouTube, to our channel, please make sure you do that. If you haven't subscribed to the podcast on your podcast app, whatever it is that you use, make sure you do that too. And we'll see you in the next one. God bless.